and ladies and gentlemen, since STEMI and non STEMI overlap in real life, so it will be these two lectures could uh, overlap a little bit because we couldn't uh, divide it very specifically and we certainly didn't uh, have any meeting before, so we'll talk about it. So, but I won't uh, try to replicate all the data that Professor Hubes has given us. What about non STEMI? If I start with the epidemiology <coughs> incident. Incidents has increased since the 1980s, and uh, one part of the story is that advances in medical care and technology have facilitated the care of older patients who wouldn't live long enough to develop STEMI in the advanced age. And the other part of the, of the story is that we developed a high sensitive test, namely cardiac troponin. So basically, we have a lot more diagnosis of non STEMI, a uh, little, little. Uh, than uh, before the diagnosis of unstable angina. So altogether, non STEMI accounts for 70, uh, 60 to 70 of uh, MI hospitalizations, so it's prevailing in STEMI. And about two thirds of those people with non STEMI are men, but the uh, women are catching up. What about diagnosis and triage? Uh, this is a classical. Uh, slide that we teach our students to, but uh, to just uh, uh, remind us we need to have symptoms, we need to have ECG changes, and we need to have a, a, a troponin, in this case high sensitive troponin, to uh, establish the diagnosis of non STEMI. If not, then we have this rule out, rule in MI, and we have some intermediate. Uh, situations where we have to observe the patients and repeat the test. These are just a short uh, 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 list, uh, if not too short, of differential diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome in the setting of acute chest pain. So you see we have a cardiac reasons, we have pulmonary reasons, vascular reasons, gastrointestinal reasons, orthopedic reasons, and even psychiatric reasons. So all these uh, entities just uh, enter the, uh, the emergency room and we have to deal, uh, uh, namely, to see the symptoms if they are from the other organs uh, or of, of the heart failure origin or, or the heart origin, but not the coronary artery disease. Luckily, we had a troponin, uh, and it was a revolution when we started to use it. So basically, we have to go over the 99 percentile of upper normal limit to detect these pathological changes, and also the uh, time of sampling is very important because if we have very early sampling, we don't, we won't have the troponin elevated, and then in this early sampling is what we really want because we will have elevated, and then we usually in emergency rooms we do one more checkup, it's the delta, and before it was three hours uh, after the initial, but uh, I will show you later that now we are trying to uh, shorten it to one hour or maybe two hours. And then in this part we need a really big uh, delta and then we diagnosis of, of uh, myocardial infarction, myocardial uh, damage is, is uh, really uh, very surely established. This is the revolution that we witnessed, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, and we switched from conventional assay, which was uh, detecting troponin in micrograms per liter, to high sensitive assay in nanograms per liter, so it is 1,000 times more sensitive. And uh, with all the assays, we have the clear pathology, we have likely normal values, and we have likely pathological values, but uh, we have this gray zone, which was too big now with these high sensitive assays we really have pathological which go down into this uh, they develop down because they detect the, the, the injury that was not possible to detect with conventional assay we have really what is normal normal we have a very very little gray zone with this uh, new high sensitive assays this is the just algorithm what to do with a patient who presents with non STEMI with symptoms with DCG and then troponin if it's very low initially or low and uh, we need the, the one delta, possibly within one hour and if the value is going down so we can rule out 
the orator register is the same. We can rule out the acute coronary syndrome, so we will discharge the patient and recommend some uh, other following testing. And uh, if we have a really high troponin, then we don't need the, the other measurement. And if it's not that high, we make the measurement uh, after one hour and we will establish diagnosis of of non STEMI acute coronary syndrome and the patient has to be risk stratified and then it will go to NGO. And of course we have some, I would say, gray zone which we have something but not uh, diagnostically important. Then we observe this patient and then we usually do other troponin in three hours, not one hour, and we implement echocardiography to help us if we see any any warm motion abnormalities and then we decide if the patient is on one or the other side of this algorithm. What about the invasive treatment? It has been shown many times, but basically after we established the diagnosis of non-STEMI, we have to uh, decide uh, the risk profile of the patient and first we have to see if the patient is, is in PCI center or the patient is in non-PCI center. If, if not, then we have to stratify risk in very high, high or low, and then if it's a very high risk and it's not in PCI center, immediate transfer to PCI center has to be done and then we treat that patient like an acute STEMI patient if he has to do the uh, angiography possibly within two hours. High uh, risk uh, non-STEMI patients will have to be uh, transferred the same day if they are out of the PCI center, if they are in, they have to be uh, angio uh, they have to have angiography on that day and then likely PCI, so this is called the early invasive strategy within 24 hours and then if the patient has low risk then we, we are selectively invasive, we decide we do other diagnostic algorithms and then we see if the patients will go to NGO but later than 24 hours or we will do some other test for ischemia. These are the criteria for very high risk and high risk so basically I won't go into the details but you can see that and you basically knew them already. I will just point on this brain score more than 140, we will talk about it a little bit later. So after we do the angio op now, so we have a patient with acute coronary syndrome expected we do the angio, we find three things. We find obstructive coronary artery disease, we, the second thing we find a clear culprit and we will proceed with PCR culprit lesion, that's as simple as that. So if we have a normal coronary, so we do the LV assessment probably with the echocardiography and then we will see uh, if the coronary is normal then we uh, will s suspect uh, minorca if there is uh, not abnormality on echocardiogram. If we have a clear Takotsubo picture then we have a diagnosis and then we have this Again, gray zone where we have obstructive uh, disease, but we cannot identify a really culprit lesion. Then there's a place for intracoronary imaging, even in the setting of acute coronary syndrome. So basically, we would do the IOS or OCT, depending on the circumstances and the uh, uh, situation in a cat lab. So to establish, do we really can identify the culprit lesion? So whoever has shown this on OCT or IOS, we can see the rupture. Uh, and uh, other uh, thrombus intracoronary, uh, which were clearly mark uh, marker of uh, acute coronary thing. These scores uh, have been more numerous uh, and they still exist, but there's a great score which is now really in use, although the recommendation is uh, come from class 1 to class 2A, but basically it's the only score which is now uh, in use and it's in a guideline, so basically score just tell us what's the risk for death or, or myocardial infarction within six months after the initial hospitalization and we just uh, put this data instantly in, in the score and we get some number and this uh, cutoff is about 140. And uh, I will show you uh, the differences where this is a verdict trial, there are numerous trials, but this is the trial I will show you where, we, where they compared early invasive and examination and treatment versus non-early uh, with patients with non-STEMI. 
and then when they see standard and they're living easy in this trial uh, standard was uh, 40 72 hours early invasive was within two hours median of uh, early invasive was four hours median to non early it was 61 hours and we see if you look at the maze there is basically there is no difference in the standard and early invasive if you put all those patients together if we just uh, put the, the of all uh, constituents of maize, so we see the revascularization uh, need for vascularization is basically the same heart failure admission, the same uh, almost significant but not, or cause mortality, no difference, refractory angina, no difference, but there is a difference in uh, uh, reinfarction and it's a clear difference, so this uh, speaks in favor of early invasive strategy. And this is uh, this verdict trial which has, uh, has taken into the account gray score and also team ACS trial with the gray score and if we divide the gray score 140 or, or, or up or 140, less than 140, then we see clearly that the patient who has a grace more than 140 have a clear benefit of early uh, invasive strategy in the verdict as well in this time ACS study, whereas the patients with grace lower than 140, they don't have any benefit uh, with the early invasive strategy. So I think the risk score, uh, uh, grace score should be uh, implemented based on this data. Now, uh, what about anticoagulation and anticoagulation therapy? Professor Huber has told us a lot about it. Basically, I will just say that we need uh, anticoagulation on one side and then the inhibition of platelets on the other side. We have all the armamentum of this agents, although in, in the cat lab we prefer still unfractionated heparin, one because we can dose it, uh, second because we can check the regular level of anticoagulation by ACT, and third we can reverse it if necessary with protamine, so I would say it's still ideal anticoagulant uh, drug within the cat lab. As far as the, the uh, anticoagulant therapy is concerned, we do with dual antiplatelet therapy, we are targeting two things within the thrombocytes, thromboxane A2, we are cyclooxygenase 1, and that's the role of aspirin to inhibit the cyclooxygenase 1, and then we target the ATP receptors and thrombocytes. We have this uh, B2, our Y12 uh, inhibitors, and the congrelor. I think it really helps, as Professor Huber has told us, we give it intravenously very rarely, but when you need it, you really need the patient unconscious, vomiting, or so on. If you want to do proper interventions, then this is the only way to, to have a, a double inhibition of, of platelets. Then we have this GP2B3 inhibitors, which we usually use in bailout situations, although sometimes when we have the big thrombus burden, we decided to give them up front because after that we see less uh, no reflow phenomenon than, than uh, if we just do the intervention, see the no reflow and start to open this distal uh, arteries. So uh, basically for bailout, but in some cases selectively we have to uh, put it up front before messing with the thrombotic uh, situation in the, in the vessel. In all time, we just have to, to take the account of the ischemic risk. These factors are promoting it and bleeding risk. And with antitrobotic treatment, we have to tailor it basically for each patient, uh, depending on this risk uh, of ischemia and bleeding. This was already shown for non stemi but as Professor Kuba told you, it really worked you know, in, in, in STEMI. So this is the, sorry, This is the bleeding risk. If it's normal, then we do the double uh, donor platelet for one year. It's not a problem. If ischemic risk is high, we prolong the donor platelet therapy more than 12 months. It's high and very high risk. We reduce the donor platelet therapy to one to three months. Mm -hmm. I won't go into details because it was already explained before. I also won't go into the details about 
it is a fine react study, but just uh, I would like to point out that this was not the only comparison of the Cagrona-Prasvial, but also uh, two strategies in the case of non stemming strategy of not giving upfront uh, donor plate therapy if you don't know the coronary anatomy, with a strategy where you do that, so in the arm they put uh, people on, uh, immediately on donor plate therapy with Ticagrelor, and it was uh, six minutes before, uh, after the randomization, that people would uh, receive the drug. In the case of Prasugal, they receive it after the coronary angel, and then it was administered, the uh, median was 61 minutes, and after that, the patient, if only the patient is proceeding to PCI. So if you see the data in this study, we see that uh, over 180 patients received or which were not acute coronary syndrome, so basically, the, we put them in the risk of bleeding without any, any reasonable cause. These are results which have been shown again. <coughs> MACE was really reduced. <coughs> it's a React PET, uh, it's a React 5, and it is combined uh, uh, non-STEMI, STEMI, and angina. Uh, and stable angina, if we uh, do the side segment an analysis for non-STEMI, we still uh, need data, but what's uh, more important is that there is no price in excessive bleeding for the drug, which is more effective. <coughs> and that reflected in, in the recommendations for, for non-STEMI in 2020, 2020 years. So Prasugrel was uh, uh, the class 2A uh, 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 recommendation, uh, so uh, that it should be preferred to take a or for the non STEMI patients. That's one thing, and the other thing is that uh, it's class 3, so not do it to administer routine pretreatment, P2, white well receptor inhibitors in patients in whom the coronary anatomy is not known, except in this class 2BA uh, recommendation if the patient cannot undergo early invasive strategy pretreatment might may be considered depending on bleeding risk. But basically, uh, this strategy proved uh, uh, in, in ISOR React 5 uh, has changed the guidelines, so we routinely don't administer in case of no stem we do antiplatelet therapy before the patient, before we know the patient's anatomy. But high bleeding risk, Professor Hoover has also told, so I won't go into the details, just that we have this BARC consortium, it's much more, much better definition than the previous TIMI. Uh, uh, risk score and we have a major and minor criteria is only you only need one major to minor uh, just to have the high bleeding risk what would I like to point out that you need to have a level before you uh, do with the, something with the cat lab because you need uh, the uh, uh, renal function, you need a level of hemoglobin and you need a level of thrombocytes. If you have thrombocytopenia or less than 100, then the patient is per se high bleeding risk. About extended depth, it was also enough data from Professor McCoover, but I would say high thrombotic the risk, uh, it's a uh, Class 2A recommendation for complex coronary artery disease with one additional criterion, so multivessel polyvascular disease, premature atherosclerosis, less than 45, and accelerated atherosclerosis lesion within two year frame. So basically, we have also for high thrombotic risk, we have a patient with reduced renal function, and on technical aspects, we have patients with three or more stents implanted with three lesions or more treated, and the patient with total stent length of more than 60 millimeter, history of complex revascularization with more than two stents uh, in the left main, correct total occlusion, in the last patent to the or last patent to vessel, and the history of stent thrombosis. On antiplatelet treatment, this is a very strong argument for high thrombotic risk. So, basically, if we have stent thrombosis, there is no place for clopidogrel whatsoever because usually, uh, if you see in the previous trials uh, data about uh, stent thrombosis between clopidogrel and, and the uh, modern P2 white atomic limiters, it's basically um, there is no justified to give clopidogrel anymore. What about the non STEMI and patients with uh, oral, fibr oral fibrillation? So basically, it's a triple therapy. So again, we have to have a 
there are risk stratification, bleeding risk, ischemic risk. This is the normal situation when we do the triple therapy in the patients with atrial fibrillation and uh, BCI in acute coronary syndrome for up to one week. Then we continue with the double therapy. So that means one antiplatelet drug and one NOAC or, or, or warfarin for up to 12 months and then only anticoagulation, anticoagulation up to 12 months. In case of high bleeding risk, one week triple therapy. Now even we, we do the double therapy. In, in this case, that means this, this part even from the beginning, but basically double therapy after one week to six months and then anticoagulation alone. And uh, for high ischemic risk, uh, we prolong triple therapy up to one month and double therapy for one year and then the uh, patient is anticoagulated. And what I would like to talk about also is single stage versus multi stage PCI in multi vessel non STEMI patients. So you always see that multi vessel STEMI patients, you okay, identify the culprit, you treat the culprit, and you have one or two additional vessels or a couple more stenosis. Should you do them in the same setting or not? It's a, it's a really mm, issue that is trying to resolve and I think it's, it's now emerging to, that uh, it's even got into the, into the guidelines. This is the uh, one study, the SMILE trial, and there are numerous studies, but if you see the, again the maze, so this is multi-stage population and maze, uh, you see this follow-up one year, then you have uh, more maze if you do the multi-stage intervention than one stage intervention, but if you break it down again, on uh, cardiac death, it's basically not significant. The overall mortality not significant, although very, very, uh, very lightly, almost significant. But what is uh, significant is the, the target vascular revascularization. So basically, if you do what is, I would say, Surprising. So, if you do the one-stage uh, treatment, you will have less target vascular vascularization <coughs> than if you do it multi-stage. Although you have more time to think about and plan the procedure. What about the non-STEMI with cardiogenic shock? It was always a debate that in the cardiogenic shock we need to treat carpet lesion. It's really recommended, and it's uh, it's what you should do. In cases of uh, hemodynamic instability and mechanical complications, <coughs> then you have to do maybe emergent surgical or, or in, uh, percutaneous repair of mechanical complications. Uh, <coughs> Intraoptic balloon pump should be considered only in the patients who had shock and uh, mechanical complications. It should not be used in the patients without mechanical complications. So, we know like seven, ten years ago, um, surgeons always ask, well, what about the intraotic balloon pump patients in shock, put the pump and bring it to surgery. That's not the case. We shouldn't do it if there are no mechanical complications. In selected patients, we do short-term mechanical circulatory support. And this is uh, the most important thing, routine immediate revascularization of non culprit lesions in uh, non-STEMI in patients with shock is not recommended, so don't do it. Just do the, the, the culprit lesion in shock and then leave the patient to be stabilized in, in the coronary care unit. I'll just show, uh, shortly show the differences last systemic uh, lines were, were in 2020 and uh, the five years ago. It was the previous guidelines, so what has changed. This rule out protocol with troponin at zero and three hours was uh, uh, class one and now it goes to class two A because we now try to do it one, zero and one hour and zero and two hours. So it's uh, now failing and it has moved recommendations from class one to class two A. CT and geography was class 2A, now it is in the cases of low to intermediate, intermediate likelihood of coronary artery disease is a class 1 method of ruling out uh, the patients with the coronary artery disease. 
With the monitoring has strengthened, so basically every patient who has a non STEMI diagnosis and he is at low risk for cardiac arrhythmias should be monitored up to 24 hours or up to the PCI, whichever comes first. If the patient has increased risk of cardiac arrhythmias, then he should be monitored, monitored for more than 24 hours in, uh, up, in, even after the procedure. So basically it has changed from class 2A to class 1 indication. So monitoring for the patients of non STEMI is, let's say, obligatory now. Uh, about risk score, I already mentioned, uh, we used more risk score before it was class 1. Now we have uh, race risk score left and it's class 2A, but we see that it's useful in this prediction of, of uh, uh, revascularization, multi-stage, one stage, or, or uh, early invasive versus normal. Uh, normal invasive intervention, and this is Bavarudin, which was class one. Now it's class two B. Thank God, because we didn't have it, uh, and uh, now it's uh, going out of picture. So basically, uh, still the uh, thing uh, unfractionated heparin rules only in the case of induced thrombocytopenia. It's it's not allowed to do, and this is. Uh, Admission of P2 white valve inhibitors beyond one year, it was class 2B, and now it is getting, uh, it's improving to class 2A recommendation. So, adding second antitrombotic drug to aspirin for extended long term secondary prevention, it's uh, going up and it's a recommendation now class 2A. In conclusion, I would say it is that non STEM is considered one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality. As we see, it's prevailing in acute coronary syndrome. It's uh, more incident than STEMI, and we know that cardiovascular mortality is still the leading cause in many countries of death. And that we have to understand different biomarkers, we can become aware of emerging new agents that are used in adjunctive pharmacotherapy, keeping abreast of advances in imaging technique as well, and the use of invasive imaging and functional assessment, and all that is critical to successful treatment. So basically, all new data which we normally use into the percutaneous coronary interventions, we have to implement it in the treating of non STEMI patients because usually we have time, we have more time than in a setting of STEMI, so we can do it, I would say, properly and uh, in a proper and timely manner. Thank you very much.